Matthew chapter 17 is just another example how God the Spirit has anointed Matthew to record for us the ministry of our king as he's showing the people of his day and us that he is Messiah. We sang that, Jesus Messiah. And how he represents God the Father on earth. In one of the hymns we sang, we sang as it, well, it's true. God is on his throne. In fact, I get reminded of that truth when I'm yelling at the TV set. <laughs> Marshall will very kindly say, God is still on the throne. And that's a good reminder. We often get the idea that he's up there and he's left us alone down here. Well, this ministry of Jesus is to show us how wrong we are. This is the Son of God. And notice that he is here on planet Earth covering all of Palestine and more. Everywhere he went, he walked. When he left Nazareth to start his ministry, that's a 60-mile hike to Jerusalem. 60 miles. We cringe at driving that far. You want me to go to Prescott? That's 15 miles away for crying out loud. Is your car air-conditioned? Jesus walked it and back. And in the chapters that I have outlined there in your insert, in chapter 14, he, he learns of the execution of John the Baptist and he feeds 5,000 people. In his grief for the death of his cousin, he feeds 5,000 people. He rescues Peter from the sea. Everybody who touches his garment is healed. He is ministering nonstop, day and night. Chapter 15. He's in the midst of ministry, and he gets challenged again, this time by the scribes and Pharisees. Your disciples didn't wash their hands. <laughs> and he's challenged by a Gentile woman. He goes all the way up to Tyre and Sidon. His headquarters now is in Capernaum. That is over 20 miles north. He walked, only to be challenged by a Canaanite woman that she wanted the bread of life, the crumbs that came off the table of the Jewish people. And Jesus acknowledged her faith, not her sarcasm, her faith, and it was granted to her. He heals everybody that comes to him, and then he feeds 4,000 more. Chapter 16. After he feeds the group, he's challenged by the Pharisees and the Sadducees now. And then he has to get after his disciples because of their lack of faith. Then he heals more people. And then he announces to his disciples, his 12, that he must go to Jerusalem and die. The same Jesus who said, you are the Christ of the living God, says, no. The same one, that Peter, that Jesus honored for his testimony, he chastises. You're either with Jesus or you're against him. You're either helping build the church or not. There is no middle road. And that's where I'm going to end this morning. We who are in the church are, even, are either partnering with him with the building up of the church or we're not. out there they're trying to destroy the church which is why we have to 
do better at what we're doing, building each other up. Now in chapter 17, six days after Peter announces he's the son of the living God, they've hiked further north, up on Mount Hermon. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us here make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. The Father speaks from heaven and they hit the ground. The Son speaks and says, Arise. Verse. And Jesus said, verse 7, Touch them. Arise. Do not be afraid. Now that arise is in the passive tense, which means allow me to help you up. In the Greek, a, well, in English too, there are passive and active verbs. Arise here is passive, meaning let me help you up. Sound familiar? We're dead in our sins, and Jesus says, arise. Let me give you new life. Let me bring you out of that. And when they had lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Hmm. Moses and Elijah, how did they know? Did they have name tags? Hello, welcome, my name is Moses. They knew. Now, those of you who know me know that hidden in this old body is just a kid. I'm thinking that when we get to heaven, there'll be no introductions. We'll know each other by the first name. We'll just know. And I get that from this. I could be wrong, but they knew. Why Moses? Why Elijah? Why not one of the other prophets? Because Moses was the lawgiver. Elijah was the one whom See what I'm saying? They knew. They were talking with our Lord. When we get to heaven, you won't find me in my mansion. I'll be looking for these guys and listening to them answer questions from other people and not say a word. Finally, I'll shut up <laughs> and just listen. Isn't that what God says? Hear him. Listen to what he says. Now notice the three men of the 12 that Jesus took with him. Peter on whose confession the church will be built, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, which is the very question we're going to ask people before we baptize them. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? If they say, well, I'm not sure, well, get out of the tub. If they say yes, whew. Now, the baptism isn't going to save them. It's the heart has been changed by what they have said to God. I believe. And that's what we're going to find out as we go through this chapter. There is a difference between saying I believe and believing. And guess who knows the truth? 
God does. He knows. That's why some who even did miraculous deeds in the name of Jesus, he will say, I don't know you. It's his call on those who believe, not the church. James will be the first apostle martyred for his testimony. He is invited to go see what Jesus is like from God's point of view. Glorified, shining in the light, not the Son of God according to the Word of God, the beloved Son of God. He got to hear that. And John, the last apostle, who will die for the testimony of Jesus. They weren't, these weren't random choices. Jesus didn't say to the group, who would like to hike further? And these three guys said no. He said, Pete, you're with me, James, John, come. Let's go. And up they went. And then they asked, verse 10, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus is going to answer that. Verse 11. Here's his answer. Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you, Elijah has come already and they did not know him but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke up to them of John the Baptist. This is the second time Jesus is announced that John is the spirit of Elijah who has come to announce the coming of the Messiah. Now many who have studied the book of Revelation think that one of the two witnesses is Elijah resurrected to come again before that great and dreadful day of judgment. See, all scripture will be fulfilled. So they come down, verse 14. When they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down and saying to him, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. He comes down from the transfiguration, having spent just a little while with three of his disciples for some personal time with them so they could see with their own eyes and hear with their own ears why he is there. And immediately he's confronted by a dad who is rightfully very concerned about his son. I took him to your disciples, but they couldn't cure him. They could not fix his epilepsy. And what does Jesus say to this dad? Ah, you faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. I don't think he said it that way. Bring him to me. What is he talking about? Faithlessness. You're either with him or you're against him. And so it is to his disciples. And Jesus rebuked the demon and he came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move, and it will be moved from here to there. And nothing will be impossible to you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. What kind? This kind of demon. Don't let anybody convince you that there are things you cannot do in the name of Jesus without prayer and fasting. He's talking about demons and casting them out. 
I've met some people who can't make a decision about anything without prayer and fasting. I've seen them in the restaurant across the table. There's the menu. They can't decide what to order. I think they're praying and fasting, <laughs> making me fast. <laughs> Pick one. <laughs> Let's eat. Now, I'm being a little facetious, but haven't you met some people? They can't decide between buying a Ford Chevy or a Dodge without prayer and fasting. I'm taking it too far for a reason. There are times, there are issues where decisions are so grave, it may require you, and God will lead you this way into prayer, prayer so earnest you forget to eat, you fast. I've mentioned before, I tried fasting and prayer one time, and all I thought about all day was food. <laughs> And I was telling somebody that who was wiser than I, and they said to me, Nolan, because you had it backwards. You were fasting to pray. Uh-huh. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says prayer and fasting. I got it. Well, you got it now because I just told you. See, some of us have to be told. We don't want to miss the point. So Jesus by the transfiguration, shows us a bit of what it's like on earth from God's point of view. In the next instant, he tells us about faith is in the terms of, I will do the Father's will. And Jesus has authority over everything. While this kind of demon requires prayer and fasting from them, he has full authority out. And the demon has to obey. Jesus is in control. That's why he's here. That's why he came. God the Father is on his throne. And Jesus is saying to us by his personal ministry, even so God the Father is on the throne, I am here to show you and tell you and prove to you he is very involved in everything that's going on in your life, even to the numbers of the head, hair on your head. He knows and he cares. This is why Jesus hiked mile after mile after mile and healed infirmities from dawn to sunset practically every day. This is why he was given the power to heal by people having enough faith to just touch his garment. He's here as the king of the Jews because he's coming back as the king of kings. He's here to build the church and has invited us to participate. And if we choose to do nothing, we're against him. If we choose to get involved, the blessings just flow. Just fall. That's why we're here. And we can't lose focus of that. 22 and 23, chapter 17. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed to the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Now he just told them this a week or so earlier. And Peter got all riled up. And now he's beginning to see that his friend Jesus, the Messiah, must fulfill scripture. And somebody's going to betray him. And he's going to be handed over to them and crucified. But on the third day he will rise, just like the prophets said. John the Baptist announced that in his ministry, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
And Jesus is reminding, that's why he is here. He's preparing them, trying to get them solid in the scripture so that when he departs, they will know how to follow the leading of the Spirit of God, whom he's going to give to them, John chapter 20. Whom you have in you. You're either for him or you're against him. Verse 24. And when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? The guy can't win. Our Lord can't win. Anybody with any kind of authority at all wants to come and challenge him. What's the matter with your guy, your rabbi? Does he don't have to pay the temple tax? No, I'm exaggerating. And maybe they said it more respectfully than that. Pay your taxes, dude. <laughs> and what does Jesus say? Smite him? Kill him? He said, pay your tax. Well, he says it very cleverly to Peter. And when Jesus had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or strangers? <laughs> and Peter said, Strangers. And Jesus said, Then the sons are free. You get it? We don't have to pay the tax. However, nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast a hook, take up the fish, and comes first, and when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take it and give it to them for you and me. Wouldn't it be great to do that? <laughs> April 14th, go fishing. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. Have faith. Pay your tax, even though you don't think you owe it. Even if you've been convinced that the IRS doesn't have the authority to collect it. <coughs> hear me? Hear me? Even you, if you think the government is going to spend it wrongly, <laughs> they're going to spend it wrongly. Have faith. God knows exactly what he's doing. He is still in control. Pray for them, tax collector and all, because if they're not with him, they're against him. And on the judgment day, those who are against Jesus go to hell. They only get one chance and that's while well, they're alive. Now, I said that wrongly. They have many chances while they're alive, but once they're dead, they're toast. We had to apply that biblical principle to 1 Peter 3 to understand what Jesus preached to the spirits in prison during the days of Noah. That's why Bruce's reminder of Isaiah 61 was so inspiring. That's why Jesus came, was to set prisoners free. Do you get the connection? He's been setting prisoners free since the garden, during the days of the flood. He's been doing it forever, and he's still doing it, and you get the honor of being a part of it. Become a fisherman of men. You get the privilege of presenting the gospel to somebody and watching their face, especially their eyes, change when they get it. When you see it, you will never forgive it. Forget it. I just saw it. Earlier this morning, I was talking to one of the brothers about the need for repentance. There is a time in a Christian's early spiritual life they need 
to repent to God. Sometimes it comes a moment after the realization, oh, they need to go to the Father and repent. Conversion isn't complete until they repent. Sometimes people will say, I, I believe. And when they really do, a transformation has just happened. And soon after that, spiritual maturity will kick in and they'll go, oh. Oh. And they will bow down before God and say, I am so sorry. Forgive me. I know I said I believe and I was bad, but right now I just realized by reading your word what you did to bring me to this point. And today I want you to see that there is a whole lot more than just that. <laughs> that was just the beginning. I want you to be part of the group that sees the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and bow down to him in glory and honor and submission to him. And not part of the group who will be forced to their knees because he is the Almighty. If you want to get inspired, just read the first chapter of the book of Revelation and see how many times. Jesus is identified as God. I am the Almighty, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, over and over again. He is our friend. He is our king. We're either with him or we're against him. It's all about faith, believing, not trying to convince you, others. And convincing him is a whole lot easier than a lot of people think because he knows your heart. And all you need to do is say to him, Today I realize what your son really did when he went to the cross, when he bled, when he died, and he wore the crown of thorns, and he took that beating that without mercy, just that hatred that poured out. I had no idea that my sin would cost so much. I, I, I just didn't know. Thank you. Forgive me. Jesus was preparing the 12 to build the church after he left. I am convinced by the first 17 chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, looking at the Lord and his ministry again through fresh eyes, that he's preparing us for his second coming. He's getting us ready for what is going to happen. So let me ask you this in earnest. Do you really believe that God's plan according to Scripture is to restore the United States of America to its previous glory? I'm sorry, I don't see it. So if you're putting all of your bank in whatever party, political or otherwise, that's going to lead us back to God, you're putting your bank in the wrong bank. It's him. Now, I'm not advocating that we give up, but what I'm saying is let's get back our focus where it should be, 
We're here to build the church, to make disciples, to baptize them, and to teach them all things that Jesus has taught us. And that's to make disciples so they can teach them, so they can make the, You see how it works? And it's to prepare our kids for what's going to bother them. That's why I think, Bruce, you're right. I'm going to bring the bow and arrow next week. <laughs> As a demonstration from archery of what happens to our kids when we release them into this world. In preparation for that, I'm going to plead with you. Go somewhere on the net and watch a video. It's about seconds, 45 minute of an arrow and what it looks like when it leaves a bow. You are going to be shocked how that arrow can ever reach a target. You're going to be amazed. I'm going to suggest from Scripture that when we release our kids into the world, that instant that they are released from our care that's what they go through. If they've been trained up right, they get their bearing and they hit the target. Who is Jesus? They stay focused. And they will not return. If they're not trained up right, off they go. Because we didn't do something correct. We're not building, we're destroying. If we're, if we're not believing, we're not trusting. And if we're not trusting, we're hypocrites. We sing that we do. We talk like we do. But if we don't actually do it, if you firmly believe that the coming of Jesus is soon, then let's act like it. Bruce and I are old, tired, cranky. We're ready for him to come back this month. Because we're of the persuasion that Jesus will return during the Feast of Tabernacles. The trumpets, Tabernacles, Day of Atonement, Fall Feast. Every September. <laughs> because we are so ready. If you're like us, Buck up. It may not be this year, nor next year, or the year after, which means we still have time to get our children lined out so that when he does come, they go too. And isn't that more important than taxes? Amen? Dwayne? Or somebody? <laughs>